CG doesn't have the best of reputations in anime. It's not that CG itself is a problem, for most people anyway, but many examples of it tend to look at best out of place and at worst... yeah. Yet despite the perception surrounding it, it's still been used many times in a variety of clever and creative ways for both long-form and short-form projects. Sometimes being so subtle that you might not even realize it's there, other times popping up in and becoming the highlights of things you'd never expect, and other times still being integrated so seamlessly into the aesthetic of a work that it becomes an integral part of it, the latter of which I may come back to in a later video. I may love hand-drawn animation, but I also get just as excited by the opportunities that CG and 3D provide for an anime work. But rather than say, oh, I don't know, spreading blatant lies and misinformation about anime production and animation in general, <laughs> I want to explain this interest by taking a look at one of my personal favorite shows, whose use of CG not only became one of the most well-regarded examples of its artistic potential, but which effectively used those elements to set the stage for a haunting story of loss and growth that to this day still lingers in the back of my mind. It's a little hidden gem from 2017 that you might have heard of, called Hoseki no Kuni. Based on the manga of the same name by Haruko Ichikawa, Hoseki no Kuni, also known as Land of the Lustrous, is a 12-episode anime series directed by Takehiko Kyogoku and animated by Studio Orange. Set on an island inhabited by sentient humanoid gemstones fending off attacks from the Lunarians, an alien army from the moon trying to harvest these gems for decoration and weaponry, the series follows Phosphophyllite, or Phos, the youngest and most fragile of the gems, as they, in spite of their dreams of joining the fight, are assigned by the gem's leader, Master Kongo, to create an encyclopedia. In the midst of their disappointment, Faust runs into Cinnabar, a gem that can produce and manipulate Mercury who, out of fear of hurting someone with their unstable powers, has isolated themselves from the others to patrol the night alone. Hearing this, Faust vows to find something better for Cinnabar, something only they can do, and sets out on a journey of self-discovery that breaks and rebuilds them both literally and figuratively. It's a somber series full of misadventures that builds toward a finale that, though a bit anticlimactic, promises of even grander exploits for Faust and Cinnabar to embark upon if a second season is ever made. The show's abrupt ending leaves its story on a cliffhanger that only continues in the manga, of which the anime adapted the first four and a bit volumes. It's the only real disappointment I have over the anime, seeing its story break off so suddenly. But as much as I'd like to dive into the manga to get a better idea of its larger narrative, for the sake of time I'm focusing this video primarily on the anime, though I wouldn't mind making a follow-up video if a season 2 ever is made, or even making one specifically about the manga when it ends. So, with that disclaimer in mind, I think it'd be best to start this video by breaking down what I think is one of the most distinct aspects of this show. For many, Hoseki no Kuni is the standard for CG and 3D anime productions. Utilizing those elements to create surreal and impactful animation and imagery you'd be hard-pressed to find anywhere else. Which is quite ironic considering Hoseki no Kuni's first animated outing had a much more traditional approach. Back in 2013, Kodansha, the publisher of Hoseki no Kuni's manga, released an anime trailer directed by Akio Ohashi to promote the release of its first volume. The ad is a fascinating glimpse into what a 2D interpretation of the series could have looked like, with elegant animation and character designs that skew more closely to the manga's artwork. However, for as appealing as its aesthetic may be in its own right, there are some notable aspects of its 2D style that, in comparison to the anime, seem lacking, specifically in its handling of the character's crystallized qualities and the level of motion impact implemented into its direction. Of course, this comparison should be taken with a big grain of salt, considering the difference of scale between a short ad and a 12-episode anime, but even so, I think that this 2D approach simply lacks the same subtlety of detail and dynamism that even the manga reached which the staff behind the anime felt was a necessity to achieve. It's part of why its director originally envisioned the series as a CG production. Instead of having traditional animation as the base and trying to capture that feel with CG, I'd always wanted to try starting with CG and making the 2D animation approach the CG. Kyogoku was first introduced to Hoseki no Kuni's manga by Katsuhiro Takai while working on Gate, and was immediately drawn to its unique sense of ambiguity. It doesn't explicitly tell you about the identity of the villains or what their motivations are. And then you have this setting you'd never think of in a million years, populated by 300-year-old gemstones. 
However, he felt that if they were to make it into an anime, simply adapting its artwork panel by panel wouldn't do it justice. And to fully capture the artwork's appeal in animated form, they'd need to do it with CG. For this, they got into contact with Studio Orange, a studio specializing in CG animation, so Seki no Kuni became Orange's first fully-fledged TV anime production as the primary animation studio. And when things finally got underway, its scale quickly exceeded their expectations as it ballooned from 50 staff to nearly 100. According to Kyogoku, a lot of time was spent adjusting to this different situation from the CG productions they were used to, and he noted that the process was a slow and gradual one. The very first storyboard is from June of last year, so it's substantially more time-consuming than regular animation. Hoseki no Kuni was a massive shift in production for its creators. But in spite of these struggles, the series was able to take full advantage of the opportunities provided by CG in many ways, the most obvious of which being the rendering of the gems themselves. They are given an internal structure with layers upon layers of textures and composition which not only makes them look as intricate as the gemstones they are based on, but which also allows in-engine light to refract through their models in a way that more closely resembles the way it would shine in real life. It's a subtle detail that captures the intricacy of its character's unique designs to a degree too unreasonable to achieve with 2D alone. This is bolstered by the many intricacies of the software itself that let the series get more creative with its direction, such as each character having their own lighting rig, allowing animators to light them individually to fit their purpose in a shot without disrupting the lighting of the entire scene, or how having a camera that can move more freely in a 3D space makes it easier to use more dynamic cinematography for its uncanny visuals and intense action. Sometimes, maybe too easily? Oh god, cut to the next thing before I- Or even how the modeling process was made more efficient by the very nature of the gem's designs. They all have basically the same proportions, so the modelers could effectively create a single base model to copy and paste, and then edit them where they needed changes. Though the resulting repetitiveness is something that did initially bother me when I first watched the show, I've come to not only appreciate such a clever behind-the-scenes detail, but also the amount of variety that they were able to create with what little of each model that did get changed, as every single one, even those with similar styles, still have such distinct looks and silhouettes, which is only heightened by their respective mannerisms. Although, for as helpful as it was, Kyogoku seemed wary of overdoing these production shortcuts. If we tried to craft Pixar level 3D, a single cut could take several days, and we would never make it in time for broadcast. On the other hand, the more you try and cut corners, the more it becomes meaningless to do it in CG. So we need to work while walking that fine line. For as slow a process as it still ended up being, the 3D nature of the show adds to its direction and designs in clever and efficient ways. But what I've always found most impressive about Hoseki no Kuni's animation is its expressiveness, especially considering how stiff and awkward the animation for 3D anime usually tend to turn out. But here, every movement feels so full of weight and energy. Whether someone be jumping with joy, wrestling with anger and or frustration, or wading through the pain of misery and loss. Something that can even be seen in the smallest of movements, like the sway of their hair or the bounce in their step. It's not only fantastic to see in the impact of its action, but also in the many visual gags sprinkled throughout the series. The show seems more than happy to play with its models to help their motion flow together that much more smoothly, and as a result, better express the personality of its characters and world. There are so many details of Hoseki no Kuni's use of CG and 3D that make it shine, from how much the context of its story synergize with its digital software, to the level of polish given to the fundamentals of its animation. It's no wonder so many people call it the first great fully CG anime. Except that's not fully true. For as notable as Hoseki no Kuni CG is, traditional techniques still played a big part in bringing its aesthetic together. For as much as its CG software brought a lot to the table, it still had its bugs, specifically in its inability to deal with collisions. At a distance, this isn't much of an issue, unless you're really looking for some clipping. But up close, it would be too obvious to ignore. So 2D is used for close-ups, effects work like water and flashing lights, and anywhere else the CG begins to show its cracks. It gives those scenes and shots an extra touch of delicacy, and for others, adds an uncomfortable layer of detail that really hammers home the surreality of it all, which is especially handy for the body horror. <laughs> oh god! 2D also played a big role in developing the CG itself. 
Though Hoseki no Kuni's production often skipped over the keyframing process entirely, going straight from animatics and storyboards to animating in 3D, there are many sequences, usually action scenes, that still use 2D pre-visualization to give the animators a better idea of how to approach them, much like how 2D productions use 3D pre-visualizations to the same effect. The best example of which I think comes from Episode 8. This pre-visualization was put together by Norio Matsumoto, a well-known animator who's worked on countless action-heavy series, and which ended up becoming a special feature for the Blu-ray release of the series. Some 2D elements have even been so well composited into the series they're practically hiding in plain sight. Specifically, the backgrounds, whose eerie calm, while well, something I initially had my problems with, gives the art direction a serene sense of emptiness, as if the world itself has left the characters alone with nothing but their thoughts to keep them company, and which, with the smallest of changes, can take on entirely new moods and atmospheres. These painted elements, especially the concept art by Yoichi Nishikawa, a former Studio Ghibli staff member, had a big influence on the decision to use this mixed media approach. As Kyogoku puts it, the series is a jumble of stock materials, but when all of the parts look so different, it paradoxically creates a sense of cohesion. CG may define Hoseki no Kuni's visuals, but its use of traditional 2D elements are just as vital to making it click. It'd probably be more accurate to call Hoseki no Kuni a mixed media project rather than a full 3D anime, the first great example of one with CG as its base. And I feel like, with all this discussion of the artistry of Hoseki no Kuni, it'd be strange not to at least mention the musical artistry found in its soundtrack, composed by Yoshiaki Fujisawa. Of course, my limited knowledge and vocabulary of music means that any ramblings I could make about its songs would essentially amount to... I just think they're neat. And if I'm being honest here, that's also... essentially all this entire video is. But I have to say, I think its music is fantastic, and does an amazing job of encapsulating the show's atmosphere at any given moment. From the slower stretches of contemplation, to its light-hearted goofs, and all the way up to the high-octane fights that keep you on the edge of your seat. It is, indeed, pretty neat. Hoseki no Kuni's visuals take advantage of its CG to achieve some stunning imagery otherwise unreasonable for a standard production, while also seamlessly blending in 2D elements to fill in the gaps where its 3D falters. It's a diamond in the rough of questionable CG anime that's as praiseworthy for its individual achievements as it is for the way they let it set the stage for its... Hoseki no Kuni's story does a lot over the course of its runtime, balancing intense drama with sincere comedy in a way that both feels natural and heightens the impact of each through contrast, while maintaining a solemn sense of contemplation that hangs over its narrative throughout. Though that focus on reflection can often work to the show's detriment, especially at the start of the series as it takes its time to get things moving. While it does give it plenty of room to breathe, it's also something I couldn't help but feel like it was something I had to get through every time I sat down to watch. And I say this as someone who generally likes this kind of slow burn approach to storytelling, but the story's cast of literally colourful characters makes it worth it. They all have distinctly developed personalities that each shine in their own right, from Diamond's self-destructive heart of gold to Rutile's deadpan demeanour, to Red Barrel and Alexandrite's obsession for all things fashion and Lunarians respectively, to the endearing level of overconfidence Faust prides himself on, and so on. And what's more, the hundreds of years of history between them adds that much more nuance and depth to their chemistry. <laughs> But at the same time, even the more happy-go-lucky moments between them are framed by a lingering sense of detachment. Many of its characters, having lived and fought to survive for so long, begin to wonder what the point is anymore. Hoseki no Kuni's characters and their relationships feel as well developed and complex as the internal structures of their namesakes. And the journey they go on is one that touches on many things, from finding one's place in the world to how little of it we really understand. And which I think can be understood from some interesting perspectives, such as an LGBTQ plus one, given the gender non-conforming nature of its characters and their designs. With even Ichikawa mentioning how she specifically drew them to be androgynous, their upper bodies being boy-like and their lower bodies being girl-like. Because how else are the anime rocks supposed to have unbelievable booty? As well as the implied romantic nature of some of their relationships. Hoseki no Kuni's 
Or it can be seen through the lens of disability, since the story heavily revolves around characters who are hindered from being able to fully participate within this world in some way because of their physical conditions. Whether it be their bodies being too fragile or too toxic, only being able to function at certain times, or needing intense medical assistance to function at all. There's a lot of interesting context and through lines with which to understand the series. But one I've always been particularly interested in is its focus on death. Its main cast, being technically immortal, are detached from the concept, to such an extent that they can't even properly comprehend it. They're only aware of it because of the fauna and flora inhabiting their island. The closest thing they have to it is when one of them is taken away by the Lunarians, who act almost like grim reapers, coming to literally harvest the gems and drag them away from this mortal plane to somewhere akin to paradise. Or paradise, never to be seen again. And it always happens so suddenly, something frequently punctuated by the way the scene suddenly shifts to high contrast imagery, saturated with bright lights and a red backdrop. It's a jarring visual turn that reflects how often death can feel like it's come out of the blue, or in this case, out of the red. One minute someone's right there and the next, they're gone. Death permeates every corner of this world. But rather than exploring death itself, the series looks at the loss it brings with it. There are many mentions throughout the show of how many gems have already been lost. It's traumatized some characters and made others feel defeated, wondering what they could have done differently, while others still have become paranoid about making sure they can protect their partners. This feeling also defines one of the main turning points in Faust's character arc. It's quite a bit to explain, but essentially, after Faust loses their arms in the middle of winter, they and Antarcticite, a gem who can only maintain a solid form at low temperatures, are sent to the core shore, where all gems are born, to find more materials to replace Faust's arms. Instead, they find a heavy gold platinum alloy that immediately bonds with Faust, and which leaves them helpless when Lunarians suddenly attack. An Arcticide is able to fend off the first wave, but is shattered by a surprise attack. The Lunarians harvest Antark's body whilst Faust is left stuck in a golden cube of the alloy's making. But just as the Lunarians are about to leave, Faust finally manages to get the alloy to respond to their wishes, and chases after the Lunarian ship, chipping away and fracturing as it gets further and further away until... it's gone. Not only does Faust lose someone close to them in this moment, but they also lose their happy-go-lucky edge. They become quiet and serious, preferring to keep busy with odd jobs rather than resting, fearing the nightmares and visions that come with it. Antarch's loss trusts Faust right into the throes of mourning, and they don't quite know how to handle it. They blame themselves for what happened, and wonder about what they could have done, how they should have reached out, how Antark would still be here if they hadn't been so useless and how none of that matters. Antark is gone, and Fos has to learn to live on anyway. Loss is a difficult thing for anyone to go through. It can feel like the whole world's been broken beyond repair. But over time, piece by piece, Fos slowly puts things back together. And though Antark's absence may always linger, it's something that Fos is eventually able to not accept exactly, but come to terms with. The series is intensely interested in the impact that death leaves in its wake, and the ways in which we cope with that pain. But it's also keenly aware of the fact that not everyone is trying to fight back against death. In fact, some people actively wish for it. I don't think it's much of a stretch to claim that Cinnabar's desire to be taken away by the Lunarians is as close as one can get in this world to being suicidal, brought on by feelings akin to depression or anxiety, as the strange way that their body handles certain chemicals makes them believe themselves to be at best a burden and at worst a danger to everyone around them. And so they isolate themselves as much as they can, only coming out to work at night when everyone else is asleep and moving so far away from the school, many people don't even know where they've gone. It's all done out of a fear of the damage they might do. And yet throughout the series, we see time and again the way that Cinnabar's knowledge, skills, and quick thinking have been able to help those around them, especially Fos, who they've literally saved on more than one occasion. Cinnabar's ability to see things as they are is clouded by this belief that they are inherently a problem, and that there's nothing they can do about it. 
For Cinnabar, there is no light at the end of the tunnel, and so it's no wonder they think it's easier to just embrace the dark instead. And it's why I've always found their connection to Fos to be so touching. They may be dismissive of Fos' promise at first, but at the end of the day, it gives Cinnabar something to hold on to. Something to get them through another day. And though they may be annoyed by Fos' answer by the end of the series, the fact that they stop to genuinely consider it is a monumental shift from how they started. That promise may have only been a small thing, but for Cinnabar, even that small amount of support can make a world of difference. That gradual shift, I think, also represents the main thematic thrust behind the series as a whole. Change. This theme is shown most predominantly through Fosa's growth over the course of the show. They start off as a plucky young rascal with big hopes and dreams who is instead tasked with far more tedious work. But as the series progresses, they are put through a ringer of physically and emotionally challenging situations that make them see just how naive they'd been. They are betrayed by someone they thought they could trust and then learn of the noble reasons behind it. They realize how mundane patrolling the island really is and how unprepared they are to fight in the first place. They literally get to see their world in a completely new light, as well as the mentor figure they'd looked up to all their life when they learned that they've been keeping secrets. It's essentially a coming of age tale, one that sees its protagonists essentially grow up, as their childlike innocence is slowly replaced with a more mature and nuanced perspective on the world they thought they knew. And along with those mental changes come physical ones. Because of their fragility, Fos frequently breaks and has to be put back together, sometimes being completely rebuilt and other times requiring replacements to fill in the missing parts. These replacements become permanent reminders for Fos of the experiences they've been through, and in themselves act as metaphors for Fos's various emotional struggles. Their agat legs, while giving them a newfound sense of purpose with the incredible speed they grant, aren't able to give them the boldness to face off against the Lunarians when faced with fighting them for the first time, but do let them run away from their feelings of frustration afterward. And their gold platinum alloy arms, while letting them blossom into a formidable fighter, also weigh them down, both literally, cause they're fucking heavy, and figuratively, as an ever-present reminder of their failure to save Antar. Hell, even the realization that Master Kongo has a connection to the Lunarians shatters Fos' world. This motif has a strong similarity to Kintsugi, a Japanese art form where broken ceramics are glued back together in such a way that highlights the object's cracks, turning an unfortunate incident into an integral part of its structure and beauty, for which gold is often used as the glue. This connection gets even more interesting when considering the fact that the gem's memories are stored within their crystal structures. So losing parts of their body also means losing chunks of their memory, as well as, potentially, parts of their personality. Over time, Fos loses those old memories and traits that define them and takes on new ones, and in the process becomes a new person, Ship of Theseus style. They're still Fos, but not entirely the same one from before. Through Faust, the series portrays growing up and change itself as a process that is inherently destructive, requiring one to shed many memories and personality traits through their experiences in order to make room for new ones. And the change they bring is one few people can ever really predict. These breaks in new parts quite literally make Fos who they are by the end of the series, and rather than emphasizing the pain they bring, shows that they aren't something to shy away from. This idea of change through destruction can also be seen in the relationship between Bort and Daya. They're both diamonds, the hardest of all the gems, but because of their specific composition, Daya is still prone to shattering if hit at the right angle. This discrepancy leads to Bort being overly protective of Daya and dismissive of their abilities whilst out on patrol, leaving Daya with nothing to do but feel useless while Bort does all the heavy lifting. So, Daya experiments with risky fighting tactics and rushes into dangerous situations to try to prove they can be useful. Something so deeply rooted in their psyche, they still go out of their way to do it even after they and Bort have split up. Their relationship does more harm than good, something they both seem to be well aware of, but don't fully realize until they finally part ways. It was a long time coming, but something had to give eventually. Boseki no Kuni's story repeatedly emphasizes the idea that change, despite the pain it can bring, is not inherently evil, but just because it can help us become better doesn't make it inherently good either. Change just is. 
It's not really something we do so much as it is something that happens to us. It's a side effect of the experiences we all go through. And the important thing to learn is to recognize when it's passing by. And to know that at some point, it will come again. Because eventually, no matter what you're going through, good or bad, helpful or painful, healthy or destructive, it too shall pass. Hoseki no Kuni is a series that I can't help but appreciate for many reasons. From its fun cast of radiant characters to its themes and ideas to the lengths the people behind it went to, to not only honor the unique qualities of its source material, but also to expand on them by taking advantage of an often dismissed art form. It stands both as a strong story in its own right and shows the potential of CG within anime, which more and more productions in its wake have been making increasingly well executed strides toward realizing. And if we're lucky, maybe even this show's status as a single season story will also come to change. Eventually. And yeah, those are my thoughts. Sorry about the lack of uploads recently, I just keep stumbling into projects that don't turn out well or that take too long to figure out. Hell, even this one was quite a nightmare to get right. Speaking of, as you might have been able to tell, I experimented a bit with structure again. Went for a more retrospective, I guess you'd call it, kind of approach, and I think it worked pretty well. Helps keep things organized and gives me something to actually work with for each video instead of just starting from scratch with each one. Only thing I'm wary of is that it might be a bit too structured, but I think it has more than enough wiggle room for me to fuck around with. So let me know what you think of it. Also, this video has been a great excuse to revisit Hoseki no Kuni. It's one of my favorite animes and I actually made a short review of it back when I first aired, which looking back I think is quite a lacking video to put it lightly. It's actually part of why I decided to make this one, to try and sort of redo that video and give the show a better breakdown that actually does it some justice. Anyway, let me know what you think. If you agree, disagree, why you think of CG and 3D in anime, if you're also hoping for a season 2 of Hoseki no Kuni one day, etc. And thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this and want to see more, then check out my last video, where I discussed the many literal and figurative pictures loving Vincent paints over the course of its 95 minute runtime. Or watch me ramble about my top things of summer 2019. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe to come fly with me. Hit the bell to stay notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, and poor attempts at humor, and hopefully, I'll see you later.